most obvious sign of this blind spot for me is the a dead rat, a plastic
it's not only that death is inevitable, as Boccaccio would have it, but that so The study the reception of an object's materials. Some scholars read how the materials of art history record its use. So this is a, a wonderful paper by Robert Sukara, which is a famous paper, and I was very fortunate to have a, a seminar with him and a few other people discussing his research there. Again, he's, he analyzes, thank you so much, he, he, he's analyzing the 
uh, the, the actual grime and dirt on a particular obje object to, to find um, uh, its, its provenance and, and its various uses. So marks of grime, wear and tear, can reveal how an object was rubbed, kissed, or gradually covered in cannon smoke. Apart from use, the reception of materials uh, is also studied in terms of the ideas of its audience, their conception of what materials represent, as well as their emotional or affective responses to them. Some well-known scholars who read medieval art in such terms include Caroline Walker Bynum and Itai Weinrib. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, so, so first theory, reception. Reception theories of all, all, all sorts of ways. So arguably the reception arguments can take the focus away from the materials of the object itself and place it on the actions and ideas of those who produce and consume them. In contrast, the second set of theories attempt to give central place to the agency of objects and in, in the themes that you've heard already, which I'll, I'll go through at the end. Archaeologists and anthropologists, in particular, study how geographic features can become active agents in shaping the social world of their inhabitants. So that, that top paper, Hill has taken note of a really good recent paper which goes through that um, uh, literature. There is, however, much greater human control over artworks than over, than over rivers and mountains. It requires quite some high theory to argue that artworks Objects produced by humans and for their consumption have any agency independent of their makers. To achieve this, some art historians have therefore drawn upon some recent philosophical trends, the so-called object-oriented object -oriented ontology and active network theory. The gambit of these philosophies is to flatten the conceptual distinction between objects and subjects, or agents and tools, to argue that the human subject is an assemblage of objects like any other, that they combine with other objects to make a flat network of actions and responses with them, and that objects have their own inherent powers and networks irreducible to human relations. Recently, Andrew Cole has argued that object-oriented philosophies that tax straw men fail to account for inter-object relations without using either analogies to human behavior or mystical language, and ultimately cannot reduce the distinction between subjects and objects without first achieving the holy grail of materialist account of consciousness itself. Okay. So if this is correct, um, my, my view is, is that you know, I'm, I'm happy for people to disagree, but it's not really relevant to, to my argument later, so don't, don't bite my head off. But if this is correct, the, the concept of materiality, at least as it is used in our history, seems to be unthinkable without considering human reception and action. Should one therefore conclude that the concept of materiality itself is resistant to theory, <coughs> that discussion of the materiality of artworks takes us away from if not the physical materials it is meant to highlight, certainly from uh, any idea of the social agency of those materials. So I'm going to here propose a third definition of materiality, and not even an original one, but one I think at least helps us better in our history potentially to think about the social agency of materials. So this theory does not refer to the ideas, uses, and perceptions of particular materials, their reception, nor to the material's inherent <coughs> physical powers and properties even if these are irrelevant to the theory itself. Instead, one should simply consider those social relations within a, within a society that would not exist, at least in a given form, without the materials of that artwork. So, in the, the words of Daniel Neller, all theorists of materiality are doomed to reinvent a particular philosophical wheel, that wheel being the dialectical relationship between subject and object. Although the basic theory I've just proposed is not at all common within our history, one could find many similar wheels in the broader traditions of material cultural studies and sociology and anthropology. So, uh, so it's a very, um, you know, it's not a particularly ambitious theoretical argument. I'm just saying art historians should maybe take a look a little bit more of, of anthropology and material, material cultural studies, and experience of material, materiality in material cultural studies. That, that's all. So to demonstrate the value of this sociological approach for art history, I will take as my subject some of Van Eyck's paintings. So Van Eyck's work is most often considered for their mimetic qualities. So if you're bored of this paper already, I'm going to show you some pictures. So uh, <laughs> and, uh, that's why I like art history so far. Um, uh, more than any painter before him, uh, Van Eyck closely rendered the uh, various textures, the textures of the objects in his paintings as well as how they responded to different sources of light. Every surface seems to have been the object of an independently undertaken intellectual exercise in reproducing the visible world. So here's the Genthold piece. I got to see this recently in, in the um, restoration. It's spectacular. And here's 
Here's a detail of the building. I mean, you can look at the, the head of Jean the fabric and basically what's in it. So, however, I will demonstrate that the paint in such panels is not simply used to mimetically represent other materials, but to compete with them. Van Eyck's panels often seem to claim that paint as a material can achieve what the materials it represents cannot. In demonstrating this, I will show how these panels attempt to change the status of painters and paintings within the Burgundian prestige society. Scholars have long noticed that Van Eyck seems to exaggerate the qualities of materials in his painting. They do not just represent ermine fur, but whiter fur than was actually available, or larger convex mirrors than could actually be made. I'm going to focus on just two instances of such material exaggeration in Van Eyck's work. First, Douglas Brine, who is just at Trinity. I tried to invite him over for this painting in New York. It's a shame, but it's, 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 this is, um, I'm going to go through some of his arguments now because it's, it's very interesting. First, Douglas Brine has recently shown how the lettering in the lower section of the fictive brass border painted upon the frame of Van Eyck's Virgin and Childhood Canon van der Parler is a representation of cast brass. This is interesting because letters were rarely cast in brass, but rather incised into it. Casting such complex forms as smooth lettering was a difficult process, as Brian demonstrates in his comparison of Van Eyck's brass with that of a rare instance of cast lettering, a baptismal font from Lübeck. Van Eyck's cast brass is therefore another instance of his painted materials being superior to the real thing. I'm picking out this example because it demonstrates how Van Eyck attempted to claim prestige for the material of paint. Brass was an esteemed material. It was used for memorial objects by high-ranking Burgundian courtiers, such as Isabella of Portugal, Gilbert de Lanois, and the Mary of Burgundy. So here's a couple of memorial brasses, as it were. See the <laughs> and a spectacular tomb, so in Bruges, for a uh, tomb of Mary of Burgundy. Uh, Van Eyck's virgin was also a memorial. So its lower brass inscription records the name and chaplaincies of its commissioner, Joris van der Parler. He is presented to the Virgin by saints, an iconography common to memorial brasses, sculptures and paintings. And this painting was placed above or near van der Parler's tomb in the church of St. Donation in Bruges. In representing a form of brass that couldn't actually be made or wasn't really actually made, Brian's conclusion is that van Eyck was claiming that the material of paint in this instance is being shown at least as prestigious as that of its metallic counterpart. So, so you can have a brass memorial, but why not get a painted one? Yeah. Oh, and I'm a painter, I can make that. That's, 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 that's Van Eyck's gambit. Too. However, Hans Belting in Die Spiegel der Welt has pointed out that Liel has a legal significance in Middle French, and it could also, this could also be translated as dutiful memory. The painting, then, is not simply accurate in its representation. It also adequately fulfills or facilitates the obligation of memory demanded by its viewer to the sitter. The conflation of these two senses in the text suggests that the paint preserves such memory better than the crumbling stone, or perhaps even the real flesh of its now dead subject. So both of these examples I've discussed, the, the Virgin and Leal Souvenir, demonstrate how uh, Van Eyck would use his paint to claim that it was a material suited to memorials. So if such a claim was widely accepted, it would significantly improve the status of both the painter and the craft of painting. Painting as a material came low down in prestige value. 
it does not seem to have been used as a gift between the high nobility. The Lord of Axel would give a painting by Hubert van Eyck, Jan's brother, to his daughter when she entered a convent, whereas Anselm Adornas, in 1470, and a counsellor to James III of Scotland, would give paintings by Jan van Eyck to his daughters, both of whom were nuns. However, between high nobles, gold, precious stones, manuscripts, and tapestries were considered more suitable gifts. Painting was also considered less prestigious within a devotional context. Recently, Michel Tomasi has noted how in the church of the Chart House of Champmol, and this is a monastery that just outside Dijon, destroyed in the revolution, um, but it functioned as a family mausoleum for Van Eyck's most eminent patrons, the, the Valois Dukes of Burgundy. Anyway, the most, in this church, the most central chapels has retables made from ornate materials. An ivory retable occupied one of the most exclusive spaces, either the ducal oratory or the main altar. And the next set of esteemed spaces, including the East End Chapel and the Chapter House and the Ducal Oratory, were each respectively, uh, each of them contained a, uh, a sculpted, gilded, and polychrome wooden retables. But retables with just simple painted panels took their place in less prestigious or exclusive areas, the church's remaining chapels and the, the Lay Brothers Choir. So a memorial, so acts as both a gift, establishing a relationship between two parties, and as a devotional object, so imploring prayers for the deceased. For, for, for Van Eyck to claim that painting was equal, if not superior, to other materials in performing such duties was a clear strategy to augment the status of the material of paint and himself as a painter. So this point brings me to my conclusion, that concerning the social agency of materials. Van Eyck's panels could be read in terms of their effective or iconographic reception by medieval viewers. Yeah, I've got no problem with this. So um, I, I really like Caroline, Bob, Caroline, Walker, Caroline Walker Byron's work and, and other people who read materiality in a different sense than I am. I've got no problem with this. So, um, so the, 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 they could also read how the, the physical properties of the paint, one could also read how the physical properties of the paint was uh, active within this reception. So the, 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 the virtuosity of Van Eyck is present only in the visual appearance of the paint itself. And, uh, and this is not Van Eyck's skill here, and the, his command over the paint is not entirely reducible to the social or ideological field. However, these points do not fully explain the social agency of the painting's materials, as, I, as I've explained it. To account for that, one has to see how certain ideas concerning materials hear their prestige, and actual social practices, such as patronage, gift-giving, memorial practices, influence one another and how by changing the one, one also influences the other. By imitating and exaggerating the qualities of other materials, Van Eyck's paintings sought to augment the prestige of paint, and thus ultimately the game of prestige itself, as wealthier patrons sought these objects for their gifts and foundations. The agency of their materials, their materiality, was therefore inherent to how they manipulated pre-existing ideas and rituals in the prestige society of 15th century Burgundy, and not simply operating within a social system or an assemblage of objects, but actually changing that system in some sort of way, even in a minor way, for just the, the, the social standing of one painter. So that's my opinion anyway, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our final speaker on the panel is Emery Hulikwichi, who's an assistant professor of English at Rice University. Her current book project, whose title, she says, seems continually in flux, argues that texts of late medieval romance evince a serious concern with ethics, particularly the Judeo-Christian imperative to love the neighbor as the self. A comparative study of English and Spanish texts, the book assesses the ethics of neighborly relations across differences of religion, race, gender, and geography. And Emily tells me that she's thinking even further ahead now to the next project with this. Yes, this is, this is a, a, a separate project from the book. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I like to stand. I don't like to, to sit and deliver a paper, so. Um, so thank you to the, the speakers before me. I'm excited to be here on this panel. So this is a paper that um, theorizes a merger between Timothy Morton's concept of dark ecology and theories of neighbor love. And a small caveat here, um, I'm working from Morton's book, Ecology Without Nature, not from his 2016 book, Dark Ecology, which I'm still reading. So this is why I, I looked to the, the previous one, and I'm um, 
as yet not convinced um, by his more recent book that, that maybe we, I'm get, that it's going to be useful for what I want to do, but that has yet to be seen. So I'm thinking this um, for a medieval archive specifically, but I think, I hope maybe the merger has, has some traction beyond that. In Ecology Without Nature, Morton calls for a reintroduction of the uncanny into the home, the oikos of ecology. He demands in a vision of dark ecology an environmental po politics that exhibits a radical love for what we call nature without becoming mired in aesthetic strategies of contemplation or ecomimesis, which ultimately keep nature at a distance. Morton's dark ecology seeks an ethics based not on finding something worth saving about the environment, which would simply preserve the idea of nature as set apart from us, even if as a victim of human activity, but rather on finding, quote, ways to stick around with the sticky mess that we're in and that we are, end quote. And then a little later he continues with this idea. Quote, we ourselves are made, are tackily made of bits and pieces of stuff. The most ethical act is to love the other precisely in their artificiality, rather than seeking to prove their naturalness and authenticity. Dark ecology is a perverse, melancholy ethics that refuses to digest the object into an ideal form." End quote. In this line of thinking, there is nothing authentic, ideal, or natural in the other, even when that other is nature, and we are similarly artificial. The ethical act in the face of this mutual artificiality is, quote, to love the disgusting, inert, and meaningless, to love what is non-identical with us, end quote. To love the non-identical requires both this acknowledgement of a mutual artificiality or non-identification and a more radical vision of love, both of which can be further articulated with recourse to an ethics of relationality grounded in the neighbor. Studies of the neighbor, in fact, have theorized precisely this juncture of non-identification, radical love, and ethics that Morton envisions for dark ecology, at least at the end of Ecology Without Nature. It is a juncture made possible by the fundamental premise of the neighbor in its psychoanalytic instantiation, that the self and the neighbor are linked by a mutual strangeness and that the relation carries an ethical obligation of love. Kenneth Reinhardt turns to the religio-ethical trajectory of the neighbor in Jewish scripture to explain its grounding of ethical love in mutual strangeness. And this is um, why I love to go to the theories of the neighbor because Morton doesn't really dig into that, that part of the theorization, um, but studies of the neighbor have. Okay, so the ethics of neighboring articulated as the commandment to love thy neighbor as thyself appears first in Leviticus 19.18. Thou shalt not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Reinhardt makes much of the reflexive logic of this commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself. He follows a line of Jewish commentators as far back as Nachmanides in the 13th century, who interrogate the ethical association of two Leviticus commandments that exhibit such reflexivity, love of the neighbor, which I just read, and love of the stranger, which comes only a handful of verses later in Leviticus 19, 33 to 34, which includes and expands the same reflexive logic. If a stranger sojourn with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger that sojourneth with you shall be unto you as the homeborn among you, and you shall love him as yourself for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Reinhardt elucid elucidates the implication of the two ethical mandates in a passage that is worth quoting at length. So this is Reinhardt. In the ethical space that opens in the nearness of Leviticus 1918 to 1934, the stranger dwelling among Jews is like the Jews, only insofar as they were themselves unlike someone else, strangers in the land of Egypt. The parallelism of the two commandments does not imply that the injunction to love the neighbor is based on a common positive feature, practice, or ideal that all humanity shares, but rather that neighbor love involves an element of essential difference, the fact that both the self and the neighbor are strange, internally alienated from the larger group, whether that be Egypt or Israel, and that this structural parallel is the only absolute basis for their solidarity." End quote. The ethics of loving the stranger, in other words, is grounded upon a paradoxical affinity of disaffinity. The structural repetition of the two Leviticus commandments, quote, articulates a principle of neighbor love based on structural difference, 
I am like the neighbor, only insofar as we are each not like someone else. And the memory or fact of that alienation determines both myself and the, my neighbor as singular and self-different." The reader in Leviticus who is enjoined to love the neighbor or stranger thus bears all the hallmarks of strangeness carried by these figures. To love such a figure as the self is to love the very fact of strangeness. The ethical subject cannot escape from her own sense of alienation from others. Concurrently, she cannot escape from her own sense of alienation from herself. This shared state of alienation is what makes love of the neighbor or the stranger so very difficult. It entails a recognition that we are all foreigners or all strangers to ourselves, as Julia Kristeva puts it. Strangeness can frighten or repulse, and yet we remain persistently, unrelentingly responsible for loving such an impenetrable neighbor, at least in uh, the ethics of uh, Jewish scripture and then Christian scripture. To love this neighbor as to love ourselves is truly risky, and this is the radical part of the love, and Morton and the neighbor theorists would agree on this. It's a radical, risky ethics. The ethical act in the face of this strangeness is to love it, which I think we can say means to stick around with it, as Morton puts it, or as I'm going to propose here for a medieval archive, to dwell with it. Hmm. And so as, as it may be obvious, and if not, I will just say it, um, I'm proposing that we can expand the very traditional human context of the ethics of relationality of these scriptural commandments to um, wider human-non-human relationality. Right? So neighbors need not be human, I don't think. So when I've, when I've thought through this in the past, I usually at this point turn to the Franklin's Tale, which is my favorite moment for human-non-human relationality um, in a medieval archive with Dorigen and the Rocks. But I'm taking this opportunity, because I've done that a couple of times, and I think I've got figured out what I want to do with that. So I'm using this as an opportunity to turn to a different Chaucerian context to think about dwelling. So uh, Chaucer uses the Middle English verb dwellen, to dwell, several times. Um, it's actually one of his favorite rhyme words in Troilus and Crusade. Um, but he uses it a couple of times as a way to describe human <coughs> relationality with non-humans, which I think is interesting. Arnir Freidenberg explicates the neighborly implications of dwelling as Chaucer describes it in the prologue to the legend of good women. So this is the text I'm going to look at now. She argues that Alceste, as sublime courtly lady, who's a Freidenberg's argument, is neighborly. Quote, the beauty of the lady and her arbitrary, capricious demands express the exactions of the ideal image, the impossibility of identifying with it fully, end quote. That is, she marks the, quote, intimacy of the eye's formation through the other, but also a limit, the eye's distance from itself, from the stranger within. So the dreamer's ambivalence, or the, the narrator before he's dreaming, um, ambivalence to, well, okay, sorry, when it's Alceste, he's dreaming. <laughs> the dreamer's ambivalence to Alceste, this intimate and yet strangely distant other, at once common daisy and courtly lady, emerges through Chaucer's description of the narrator's dwelling. The dreamer describes his obsessive resolution to keep looking at the daisy. Me thought imicht die be die, dwell in all way, the jolly month of my, with uten slet, with uten met, or drink, a dune full softly egan to stink, and blinding on me elbow and me seed, the long day, a shop me for to bid, for nothing else, and it shall not lie, but for to look upon the diocese. The dreamer, of course, does not abide in the meadow beside the daisy the entire month of May, without sleep, meat, or drink, but rather, for darkness of the nicht, the witch shed the red, home to me, whose full swiftly he may sped, to go on to rest, and early for to risa, to send this floor to spread as he divisa, and in a little herber that he have, that bench it was on tourists, fresh he grab, he bad men should me, me kucha mark, for dainty of the new summer sack, he bad him straw and floor is on me bed. The dreamer intends to dwell there in the meadow with the daisy always, but ends up instead rushing home each night where he's created his own little meadow, right, with turf and flowers, um, to rest there before rushing back to look at the flower again the next day, this fleur that he so love and dread. So there's an ambivalence in his love for the flower, an imperfect corollary to the daisy's metaphorical love of the sun and dread of the night. Breidenberg takes up this ambivalence um, in this inconstant dwelling. 
As she points out in the Middle English Dictionary, uh, the verb dwellen means to delay, to be tardy, as well as to take time, to linger. It means to restrain or pause, as well as to treat at length. It means to stay, to sojourn, to wait, with their implications of temporary stillness, as well as carrying the more permanent connotations of residing or inhabiting. It means to stand fast and endure, as well as to be contingent or to depend upon something. It means to survive and endure, or to be left as a remainder or residue. And Freidenberg's conclusion when she's discussing this is to say, when one dwells, one is either at home or away or a bit of both, neighborly. So the narrator's dwelling, right, is, is both a coming and a going in this sense. The dreamer's ambivalent love for the daisy, who both will and will not become obsessed in his dream, um, oh, in the dreamer, sorry, ambivalent love for the daisy. His restless dwelling most tellingly signifies the ambivalent perils and demands of neighboring. Breidenberg has um, brilliantly shown, I think, in this analysis, the ambivalence of the masculine chivalric self's love for the courtly lady, who guarantees and limits his identity, and who makes possible his capacity for sacrifice, self-rescue, and ethical subjecthood by standing in the sublimated place of the ideal image. I'm not gonna explicate that argument here, uh, but simply to note that it's an argument primarily about human subjectivity and relationality with human objects of desire. But in light of what I've suggested today about an ethics of a neighborly dark ecology, I'm interested in what more we might say about the narrator's ambivalent love for the daisy. And when I was first writing this, I was thinking, well, let's, let's, let's pause. Let's not go to where the metaphor wants us to go. Let's think about the daisy of the daisy. Um, but then I read another article about the way metaphor itself kind of might actually be working for us as well um, in this. So this is, I'm, I'm very interested in where you think this might go uh, with me, help me think through where it goes. Um, it will go somewhere if I can find my place. All right, um, there we go. So late medieval poets who take the daisy, or in the French tradition, the Marguerite, as their metaphor of both poetic figuration and of the beloved lady, invite us to these metaphoric meanings even as they reify the daisy as a flower. And so Peter Travis's argument is um, what pointed this out to me, um, where he writes, uh, these poets insist the reader give full credence to the powerful reality of the metaphorical icon itself. My poetry places before you this flower, which is a flower, is a flower, is a flower, end quote. Travis points out this, that metaphor was itself uncanny, and that makes me think neighborly. Uh, for some of its early thinkers, among them Aristotle and Augustine. As Travis puts it, metaphors are, quote, foreign but familiar, threatening but delightful, falsifying but validating, supplemental but essential, end quote. So given that, what stands out most to me um, about the prologue to The Legend of Good Woman is the, neighbors, the narrator's uncertainty about an affinity with the daisy. Chaucer insists that Alceste both is and isn't the daisy that his narrator so admires, and I'm interested in the way this sort of blurs and shifts here. Quine Alceste, that Thurmid was in Toa Diocese, seems on the one hand not to be the specific daisy of the narrator's contemplation, which is present during the dream. Uh, when the god of love and Alceste see the daisy when they arrive, Richt alone as that begone espia, this flur which that eclept the diocese, full suddenly they stint in all the tones and knell of doom. But on the other hand, in a dreamscape, the daisy and Alceste could well be one and the same, um, even as they both sort of stand there separately. But my point is that the narrator seems confused about this. He has to ask, and is this God Alceste, the diocese, I mean, una hertis rest? And when he asks this, is this Alceste, the daisy, I'm wondering about what is he gesturing toward? Is he gesturing toward her? Is he gesturing toward the daisy? Um, what are we meant to sort of understand from this? Does he mean the woman? whose huit korun above the grain mad hirlike diese for to sein? Or does he mean this flour that is so love and dread that grows at her feet? When Alceste sets him a generous writerly penance, he says, well, hath she quit me, mean affection that he hath to hir flour the diese. Um, and even this sort of moment of realizing that they are the same or that the flower is hers 
ambiguous because the daisy is already igida and ladi sovereigna before he starts dreaming. And I'm interested, finally, my last question for, for you today, for us to consider, is um, what ecological neighborly implications arise from the affinity the narrator exhibits with the daisy, whose sun-worshipping and turf-embedded behavior he so closely imitates. The haste and rest he exhibits in response to the turning of day to night and back again mimics the daisy's tracking of the sun, such that Travis remarks, quote, the narrator almost turns into a daisy himself his crepuscular stirrings at dawn and dusk, his subsolar motions to and from the daisy's bower, and the floral habitation of his own natural bed translate him into a heliotrope, an andromorphic flower sensitive to the sun." End quote. This is a narrator moved in extraordinary ways by the daisy and the sun, imbricated in extraordinary ways with the daisy and the sun. And I actually had a Karen Barad quotation in here near the end that I, that I took out, and now I'm regretting that I took it out. On the one hand, the narrator's aesthetic contemplation and poetic invention holds the daisy continually at a distance. And here we can consider again that, that the daisy um, or the marguerite is a traditional medieval figure of poetic invention itself. And the god of love ha has this charge to the narrator um, as well that of Alceste should thee reaching the bay. On the other hand, to the extent that the narrator spends as much time running away from the daisy as kneeling in rapt contemplation before it, and to the extent that in this way he seems to be turning into a daisy. We might consider that Chaucer recognizes a strange affinity between the human and the floral here that may forward a more complicated ethics of relationality than the sort of aestheticizing contemplation that Morphin critiques when he critiques ego muses. So a neighboring ethics of dark ecology recognizes that human and non-human relationality is as often vexed, fitful, asymmetrical, contingent, with Dorigen, I would then say aggressive, but maybe with the, the dreamer, I'll say lazy, um, as it is harmonious and symbiotic. Merging these strains of thought forwards an environmental ethics, I think, that attends to the necessity and the difficulty of behaving ethically when we are least comfortable, and also perhaps when we are most comfortable, most at ease, relaxing in the sun, even if that's only temporary. It's difficult to behave ethically when it is least to our obvious advantage to do so and when we're least sure what it might even mean to behave ethically, even if we can spout what ethics say, as the narrator does in the prologue. An ethics of the ecological neighbor finds its strength in its uncompromising claim regarding the extent of our ethical responsibility as it forces us to recognize ourselves as strange beings embedded in a strange world, our tendencies to disguise or aestheticize our desires via the non-human world notwithstanding. The solution that dark ecology and the neighbor, neighbor studies jointly suggest, I think, is to dwell with the strange affinities that emerge from the darkness of ourselves and of our ecologies, even when it is the sun that we're tracking and the dark that we're running away from. Thank you. Uh, a lot of time for questions, so thank you to all three speakers, and I'll just open for questions. Everyone's thinking. Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and I think that um, 
But I think that the second part of what you said about um, embracing others, I think that what's so interesting about the helplessness that Chaucer imagines in The Nice Tale is how isolating it is, right? That, that that's where the bleakness goes, right? Um, and, I, and I think that, um, I mean, I guess just what I've, what I've been struck by repeatedly in, in reading a lot of this theoretical work from materiality is how, <coughs> despite explicitly stating that it wants to offer an alternative, it's very easily absorbable into the existing status quo. It's kind of how in the earlier panel, we all ended up talking about social media, like all roads run back to the same place, which is to talk about how here we are in, um, uh, in something, in a place where technology is the defining um, thing that we all need to do. You know, why, why do we just accept that making an app is the highest calling that one can now have. Um, I don't, like how did that happen? And that's what my paper is trying to get at, like that some of the theorization that we're doing isn't aware of its own political complicity. Do people still need to be speaking into microphones? No, it's yeah. fine, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I've been checking. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, to understand what I'm, d I mean, this is this this paper is um, come out of a project not about the concept of materiality directly, but a research project called Jan van Eyck, and this is the, I suppose, just the, the methodological musings which come out of that which I'm presenting to you. So, it's part of uh, another project, and that project really is to understand how uh, the, the social development of Jan van Eyck's style and to, to participate in a set of arguments which very much already exist uh, in that field. To make an intervention, and I didn't. Of course, I didn't frame this paper within within the, that historiography because that's not. This isn't a Van Eyck conference, so so there's a reason why I take that approach. But I I I I've, I'm not. How can I describe? Despite my deep suspicions of object-oriented theology, well, criticisms of object-oriented the, um, uh, philosophy and acting network theory, um, I nevertheless think that's a very interesting suggestion, 
so related to the metaphysical ideas of these images. It's something I've been considering in another example I didn't give. I tried to just give the two clearest examples with a lot of secondary literature already behind it, so I can make the argument easy, which is the Douglas Bryan example and the <coughs> Leon Souvenir example. There is another <coughs> something I'm considering where, concerning the, 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 the. Do we have the PowerPoint? I run, is this a model of people? I, I show it an image. Okay, well, there's some tiles on, uh, again, altarpiece right at the top, you know, the, the Virgin is sitting. And these tiles are really interesting because these are tiles which come from Spain. And they're appropriated or used and given as gifts to uh, Burgundian um, nobles who particularly have connections. So with, with Spanish princes. Um, so, no, 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 no. No, get it altarpiece. It's, 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 it doesn't matter. It means, means. It's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they're majolica tiles, and they're used, they're represented in the Ghent altarpiece and, and, and uh, uh, to, 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 to furnish yeah, heaven, yeah, to furnish yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so yeah, next one up, next one up. We might even not even find the detail. So these tiles here, you can't see them, no point, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but, uh, but these, they're very, very interesting when you get, when you get a detail of them. And, and what, what, what do you do when you have... Uh, a painter who is taking what is a prestige object, giving his gifts to Burgundian nobles, and using it to represent a, a, a theological uh, environment, so to, to represent the heavenly world. And there is something metaphysical in that. So in this idea of the, of the supermateriality, it doesn't. That idea doesn't just emerge from the prestige of the tiles itself and the gift economy. It all, there's also the, um, the the representational capacity of paint to imagine the metaphysical is. Um, integrated with that to get that type of iconography. It emerges from the practice of paint and from gift economy, that type of idea in that iconography. So that is probably one way I can sort of explore the, that idea you have, and it's, uh, it'll add, probably add a little bit more pluralism to my, my essay introducing some other theories, because I've, I have been struggling to integrate that example, which I didn't present it within the rest of my paper. So it's an interesting idea. Thanks. I don't want to shut down anybody's metaphysical party. Um, but <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I'm coming uh, to, um, I mean, as I'm sure was clear from my paper, I'm coming to materiality from uh, materialism focus. Um, and, and because of that, just because of that being, having been such a shaping, I mean, Emson and Raymond Williams having been so shaping in my earlier work um, that I, I, I see that as a path that still needs to be trod and reincorporated into this discussion. I mean, I, I don't, um, yeah, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. Could, I don't know, I'll let other people answer questions. <laughs> um, I guess I wanted to ask the entire panel about um, ethics and agency, because it seemed to me that, I mean, I, to lay my own cards on the table, I think I've, you know, I've never been a particular fan of um, ontology as a, as a modus operandi for thinking about um, the object, but, um, but one thing I did get about that move was the desire, was the, the um, sort of being taken up in something and acted upon Rather than the you know sent you know making the sort of human agent and ethical agent as the you know full on kind of center of you know of these kind of conversations and so I thought Emily's um, you know moving into dark ecology and the sort of um, notions of tarrying or of delaying or dwelling um, as as precisely a kind of suspended place where action and ethical action in particular is unclear, right? So not just being with the, you know, being with the horrors of the neighbor, whether that's the horrors of climate change or whatever, you know, the neighbor, but, but not being clear about what the ethical act is. And so I guess I just wondered if there's a, if we could talk a little bit about um, the confidence in outcomes of our acts, like the ability to, I mean, we do this all the time, I do it in my own work all the time, you know, this move by this, you know, poet, artist, painter had this effect, had this ethical effect, made, that's what we do, right, that's our job, right? But on the other hand, it, it, it struck me listening to your talks that, you know, there is a kind of um, maybe an anxious confidence, right, that we know that a particular act is ethical, 
in a, in a particular context. So I wondered if maybe we could probe the dark part of um, dark agency, ecology, neighborly painting, or some <laughs> combination of those things, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I can, I can start. I, I think that that is, I think I share with you a sense that that's one of the things that I think is useful about the neighbor um, as an ethical framework is that um, it, it, it refuses, um, as a theoretical set of um, people, uh, ideas, um, refuses to uh, make a claim that we know for certain what, what that ethical act is going to be, what is truly going to serve um, the other because because of the way it wants to recognize the fact that uh, we can't know things about our own, we can't really get out of necessarily our own um, our own desires and our own uh, prejudices. Like it's, just, it's very hard to get out of that and it's very hard to get into the head of the person or the object or whatever that we're, that we're trying to be ethically toward. And so it's, it takes that as a kind of premise and then it theorizes, so then what do you you know, can we can we dig into why that's so difficult and into opening up a kind of space to think through, to maybe pause, as you said, or, or dwell and think through uh, those problems. And, but I, one of the things I wonder about it then is, is there a pragmatic theory of of ethics possible with the neighbor? It, because, precisely because it's it's not going to make it easy for us to come to an, an act or a process, and and so perhaps that's a very good thing to open up that space and to dwell. Um, mm. I certainly like that as a way of thinking about the medieval archive um, and Chaucer's poetry, especially in some of these moments. And, and just to, for Katie, if I could sort of add, another gripping list is that's also a Chaucerian original is the painting in the Temple of uh, yeah. uh, Mars with all the yeah, you know the yeah. dark imagining mm -hmm. of all the yeah. um, which seems almost the sort of mm -hmm. counterbalance to the virtue of necessity Boethian speech at the end, but yeah. Well, I think I mean that's, I think that's a, a really good question. I think it links um, back to Holly's point about like how do we know <laughs> like that um, that helplessness is is bad, and I think that um, we don't right, and that we can't ever be confident. But I think that's you know that's partly the the point is that you know any moment in which uh, the questioning is built in um, that that's all that one can have, right? I mean, that, that, that the moment that one becomes confident about ethics is the moment that probably one is failing to act ethically, right? And I think that, um, and I think that that's, that's something of what's going on always in Chaucer because of the shiftingness, right? Um, and that's why I really like your paper with the neighborly thing is that it has to be uncomfortable, right? I mean, it can't ever, be um, something that is easy, right? Um, and that, so I, I mean, that, that's why the, the helplessness, like if you embrace helplessness um, as something with your fellow things, that's one kind of helplessness. But if you embrace helplessness as some kind of self-promotional yeah. exercise, right, that would be an, another kind. Well, no, no, so I just want to give a, there's a, I think there's a difference a little bit between what's been argued by these papers and what, is, what I've been trying to get at. So I'm not, I'm not with this paper in generally interested in ethics, but so just politics. Okay, okay. So, and, uh, and, and my, my, my theory of agency, I, I think I, what I try to argue that my, so I suppose, materialist, historical materialist or sociological theory of agency, the edge that it has over the reception theories of object or ontologies is that agency is conceptualized not sort of being operative, Within a social system, actually changing it 
so in some sort of way, even even if even if in a mild way. And um, uh, I, I, I'd say that's that's why I suppose based on some simple observation. What I would say, what, what I would say is why this is important, is that I looking at the looking at the ways that materiality is used in our history. So it's what I get slightly frustrated with with the the Bruno Latour type arguments which are developing in our history is that if, if, if people are if, if taking a methodology which looks at networks of objects and, and it makes people think about different things, that, that's fun, that, that's cool, I'm okay with that. It's sometimes occasionally the political claims which come with that, with, with, with scholarship, that there's anything, something, something politically radical in, 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 the, in Bruno's resource thinking about, um, thinking about objects or in, <coughs> or in eco-criticism. I, I, I have a slight problem with this. I, I find it very, very striking, for instance, that he cites Margaret Thatcher on page five of Reassembling the Social, quite uncritically, that there's no such thing as um, society, only, only individuals. Because there's no such thing as the social whole. There's only interconnections between objects and things like this. And we've seen that in our history. We've seen that with Gombrich, there's no such thing as art, only artists. His associations, of course, with Karl Popper and his politics. And they and were in, with, a, with a group with Hayek had a direct influence on Margaret Thatcher and, and her ideas. And, and, and I, I don't, of course, mind the, the, the people taking these, these methodologies and developing ideas with them. But, if, but I find it highly problematic to claim that there is anything politically radical or progressive um, in, in doing so. And that's, that's, I'd say that is my issue, rather than all the ontological stuff and all the ontological base with those, types of, with those types of theories. And so when I'm presenting this alternative, I'm saying there's nothing particularly progressive or radical about writing about Jan van Eyck, and it's going to have an impact on anything like this. I'm, I'm, I'm not claiming that, but it, is, but, it is, but it is nevertheless an analysis of agency which is looking at the aspirations of um, uh, individuals in a certain class situation or a social situation like Van Eyck and how he can improve his situation within that social situation. It is still a, 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 cl a class analysis and a social analysis which nevertheless is integrated or has come from a, a, a radical left-wing tradition in, in uh, Marxist and art historical scholarship. So I, I, I could claim it if I wanted to, but, but I don't. So, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's my round table. So, uh, I was actually just writing this down in further musing after after Patty's question because I do think I have to think a minute more about what I think that the neighbor theorists are doing with this. But um, but for me, it, it very much is a tension between a kind of ethics as a process or an awareness and ethics as an action um, when we're thinking about the neighbor and we're thinking about um, the ethics that is proposing whether or not we're linking it up with dark ecology as I'm proposing we're, we're doing here. And I mean, in the scriptural injunctions, if we want to you know, trace the ethics from there, and I like to do that um, for a variety of different reasons, but if we're, if we're thinking from there, I mean, it's, it's not just, at least in that version of, of a way of thinking about ethics, it's not just, I think, the awareness of, of difference itself wouldn't be ethics because there's the commandment to love, which is an action. Um, and then there's all sorts of uh, theological commentary and, and other philosophical musings on what does that mean? What is what sort of love? What does that look like? Um, and so the way I've been toying with thinking through this so far is, is to come to this idea of dwelling um, partly through 
um, having read this work uh, by Aaron Frankenberg and partly through thinking about the Franklin's tale because of Dorigen and the rocks and, and, and the way that she, uh, she lives right there, right, by those rocks. And Chaucer calls her castle at one point her dwelling. Um, and, and she's always, she's moving around a lot, but she's always circulating back around to the rocks and the tail keeps coming back around to the rocks. And, and so that felt very productive to me as a kind of, maybe an ethical action as well as a kind of pausing and reflecting um, because there's, there's actions of living in a neighborhood, right? That, that comprise dwelling in the neighborhood, which doesn't maybe necessarily just mean we're contemplating or we're aware of difference, but that we're trying to, in some ways, act out and live with then the implications of the difference. And, and I'm not yet sure how that would, what I would say about the prologue to the legend of good women as um, responding to that. But I do think that that is precisely the, the question, right? That is the tension. Um, I'm, I'm still thinking about that. I, you know, it's, I haven't done a lot of thinking about what you might think of as like the positive aspect of ethics, I mean as in, you know, a body of ethics, um, because recently I've been working more on the failure of, of text to generate moral precepts, right, that that's where my work has been recently, so it's really more about failure, right, for of people of kind of readerly uptake, like that you read something and then fears of failure. Um, but in terms of, um, in terms of this particular text, you know, Chaucer's Nice Tale, um, and thinking about ethics, I think that um, there's also the question of, are, you know, are we understanding uh, action in um, the, I don't want to say the right way, but are we understanding action in a way that is helpful for this particular text? Um, because, of course, Chaucer has all across his um, uh, poetry uh, a kind of more complicated version. I mean, action isn't necessarily action, right? I mean, um, it can be just enduring, right? Can be an action, uh, which is also what the objects do, right? So there's, it's not, um, I don't think it's as, is, as uh, it's not never as defined as clearly for Chaucer as it is so easy to make those lists, right? Which is precisely my point, right? That in making the list, you're kind of suggesting that it's very easy to identify when something's an object. Um, cause, but that's not really how it functions in the text um, because they're always not acting and acting, on, being acted on right at the, at the same time. Any further questions? All right. I think we can go into a coffee break then, which we have until 3.45, so we've got a nice half an hour. Please join me, however, first in thanking our panel.